and welcome back to my channel. I am Mala and today we'll be talking about the books I read in May. There was the Asian Readers on in May. In May I read just Asian books and some fantasy books. I also read, read, listened to some audiobooks. Also I've reached my goal of 60 books a year thanks to my January 27 books. I've read 60 books this year so far and there will be more. Previously I've been just listing the books I read chronologically which doesn't make much sense thinking about it. So this video, <laughs> we actually have categories. <laughs> so split them up into Asian reads and fantasy. Yeah. So for the Asian reader thorn, there were five prompts, five challenges. I'll list them up. And yeah, I was just with my first book, I kind of already ticked off three. So the first book for this video is A Tale for the Time Being by Ruth Ozeki. So this is a contemporary magic realism book written by a Japanese American or American Canadian, ethnically Japanese. In this book, Ruth, it's like semi-autobiographical, so you have Ruth and her husband in this. She finds a Hello Kitty lunchbox washed up ashore. So she lives in a very remote island in Canada. So she suspects it's debris from the 2011 tsunami. So inside it is the Journal of Now a 16-year-old girl who lives in Tokyo. Now's journal covers a lot of difficult topics like her life, her suicidal dad, bullying and whatnot. And she originally wrote it to document her great-grandmother's life, a Buddhist nun. While Ruth uncovers the mystery behind it, she also gets more invested in her story and also reflects on her own life. So this takes off two challenges, which is written by an Asian author and features an, uh, an Asian character who is a woman and older. It is also recommended by Read with Cindy, so it's highly recommended. What I thought about this book, I enjoyed Nao's part of the story. So you read Nao's diary alongside with Ruth. So I enjoyed Nao's voice because she really seemed like a teenage girl. But Ruth's story is so boring. I mean, she's just going through a middle life crisis because she moved from a city to a little town and you know, she, she's like thinking about it and reflecting about it, thinking if it's just like a midlife crisis. So she gets very invested into Nao's story and wants to help Nao. But you know, she realized that it's, it's a diary so she might not even be alive and that kind of thing. So yeah, in Nao's part also, there are footnotes basically like saying uh, those cultural references because we are reading it with Ruth, so Ruth writes them down. And with all these books written by like Japanese Americans writing about Japan, same with Korean Americans writing about Korea, they always cram a lot of like cultural things. They, they want to teach you about their culture, right? So they cram a lot of it, but sometimes it feels a bit too forced. Yeah, in this one it was okay, but like in some other books I've read, they just felt very forced. Throw back to January's If I Had Your Face. Yeah, overall it was okay until the magical realism part came in and then it just sucked me out of it because it and it happens near the end and then they try to justify it and then the last chapter or the last two chapters are talking about like quantum walls or something and Schrodinger's cat so it just I it just gave me a headache when I ended the book because they're just talking about this kind of this kind of things and um, it, it just I didn't like it because I, I would I'll be fine if it was just like Roof story, not roof story, uh, now story, but with roof story, it's just it just drags it down a bit. So I, in the end, I give this a three point five. Okay, next book I read, I read this on Libby. I read quite a lot of books on Libby this month. It is The Cabinet by Unsu Kim, which is a sci-fi magical realism book written by a Korean author, translated into English. So part of like the challenge is to read. You can't like repeat the same ethnicity. So if you read a Japanese author, you should read a not Japanese author just to count it in the challenge. So this is a Korean one. It takes off just written by an Asian author. Yes. 
So uh, in this, there is the cabinet 13, an office manager, he's hired to do some like basic manager stuff at some research lab facility. It's not a lab, but they, they do research there. But he's just in charge of like ordering like stupid, not stupid things, like office things. So he only has like one thing to do the whole day. He's very bored with his day-to-day -day life. So he goes snooping around the office, the different levels, and finds cabinet 13, which is full of reports of people. <laughs> so the people in questions, they're called symptoms. There are people who have some sort of like weird quirk, like eating gasoline and surviving off it, or eating glass, or like having a ginkgo tree grow out of them and they're, they're still living. So they're theorized to be like an in-between of humans evolving to a higher species. So yeah, it's full of reports of that. And then the professor found out that he, he read it, so he hires this office worker to manage also to like interview these kind of symptoms. Symptom, symptoms. So most of the book is just like short stories of him talking to these symptoms and it covers a lot of like office work, daily life issues, like I don't know, just get to go out, anxiety, this kind of, it's like kind of all, all over the place until, until plot happens in the last third. And then the whole thing falls apart <laughs> also, <laughs> again, like I'll be happy with just short stories. Because when the plot comes in, it just undermines the whole thing because instead of magical realism, it becomes a bit of a sci-fi. And then, uh, basically, <laughs> spoilers-ish, your main character gets tortured because they are trying to find out, they want the files, like some society wants the files and then they're like, give us the files and then he gets tortured and then it's written in graphic detail how his all his fingers and digits gets taught gets you know cut off and then he goes into witness protection and then it ends so i'm like what yeah so where's the there's not it's not really a resolution because we never know if the files exist on or not and then uh, just confused in the end short stories will be a better read and I gave this a uh, three stars. Okay, the next book is a YA fantasy. It's called A Magic Steeped in Poison by Judy Island. It's a debut novel for this novelist and it has a beautiful cover. That's the main reason why I read it because I don't read YA anymore. So, but the cover and also the, the plot kind of intrigued me. Yes, this is first in the Book of Tea series. So in this, there's tea magic, like tea brewing is a kind of magic. Magic Steeped in Poison is actually written by a Taiwanese-Canadian author. It's set in like an ancient fantasy China. There's still different regions and different foods, but their foods are very similar. Okay, <laughs> that's the point. Okay, we follow Ning on the journey to join the kingdom's Shenong Shi competition. So Shenong Shi is the magic of tea making. And then Ning herself is not the Shen Nong Shi of her family. That is for, the title is for the mother, but the mother passed away from the poison that is a po from poison tea that Ning herself brewed. And her sister also drank it, but her sister is still alive because the mother saved her with her last breath, but her mother died, yes. And her sister is supposed to be the like student of her mother. But then, you know, she's suffering from the poison tea, so Ning goes instead. And she goes to find out why there's poison tea around the country. That's the main reason. She wants to know why and who is behind this. And also, there's a, there's a political conf conflict, there's romance in this. So this takes off two challenges, a ch universe that's totally different from mine, because I live in England now. And even in Singapore, I was not very, like, Chinese. <laughs> And a beautiful, beautiful cover. What I like this book is the world building. It describes like different provinces very vividly. It, it they dis like it the food descriptions in this and just like. And yeah, it's parallel to the Chinese food that we have. So while I was reading it, I got hungry. It's just the world building. The descriptions of the tea ingredients seems very well researched, but uh, the plot, the plot, the characters, very flat. 
so many plot conveniences happen. Like for once in this challenge in the competition, Ning needs to find some something that's hidden within the flowers. Like there was like this whole lotus garden or like ponds or whatever. And then she's supposed to find something that that's hidden in the flowers. And then uh, there's only three of them. And then she talks to the, <laughs> she talks, she communicates with the flowers. And that wasn't like established earlier, like that she did have this power. It's just conveniently, she has this challenge and conveniently they bring out that she has the power to communicate with the plants. So it's just very convenient. And also well, in Ning's point of view, but like, even though I thought I knew her, whenever she does things, she does things that I did not expect her to do. So I don't really get a good grasp of like her character or any of the characters really. And then there's the love interest, which is, I mean, he's fine. Ning's, I don't know, just Ning's point of view, just very frustrating to read because they like she drank this truth um, tea and then she has she still doubts him for some reason eh, i don't understand in the, and it's an insta love don't like and it's also re written in present tense which i don't know i think this is the first book i read that is in present tense or at least it's jarring enough that it i realized it was in present tense so yeah this is the character's plot not nice but the food description very nice i gave this a 2.5 stars. So the next one is a Japanese contemporary uh, that's translated into English. This is There's No Such Thing as an Easy Job by Kikuko Tsumura. So in this, a 36-year-old woman who was burnt out from her previous job goes to an employment agency and asks for a very easy job, one that doesn't need thinking, one that's close to his, her home, don't need writing or reading or whatever. That's basically it. It's a short story collection because she moves from job to job. So in this, there's five jobs she moves to. So you read about all these odd jobs. One of it is like surveillance for on this man. So they put like spy cameras in this guy's house because he has a contraband that another person gave to him, but he doesn't know. That one's the first one. That one's quite interesting. Another one is writing facts for a cracker company. So you know the back of crackers sometimes have like facts and she, she did that job for a while. So yeah, I liked it in general. It's I like how the jobs always end up, like they have to do things that are not advertised because that's, that's all jobs. But who am I to say? I haven't, I haven't worked in a while. <laughs> also, it's interspersed with uh, some pop culture fact. Sometimes it goes on for too long, but it's all right. The last job though that is interspersed with this, I think fictional soccer issue, this soccer player that is revolves a lot around this soccer player and whatnot and I've just not very interested at all because I don't like soccer. <laughs> soccer or football, I should say football. I think that's it. I In general, it was a easy fun read. I like all the individual stories other than the last one. The last one was not that interesting. The main story is just saying that oh everybody has their own struggles so it's not very deep but if you want to read, if you're an office worker, feel a bit burnt out, you should read this I guess. I guess. <laughs> I gave it a 3.5 stars. So the last Asian book I read is the Ishiguro book. <laughs> Remains of the Day. I don't know if this counts in the challenge itself because I read this after um, there's no such thing as an easy job and that's Japanese too. This is also, even though she's, he is, I think British, Japanese, Ish Ishiguro. So it's the, the Remains of the Day. Uh, there is a movie on this and it stars Anthony Hopkins and apparently it's very good. Uh, this is a hi historical novel. So in this, in 1956, Stevens, a butler who has been working for over 30 years, decides to go on motoring trips across the West Country to visit his former worker. Yeah, he reflects on this journey, on his job and what he has done during this the last 30 years. So. At first, it was quite boring because you're just reading about a butler, right? But after 40 pages, I was hooked. So I, I knew there was an unreliable narrator going into it, which I think helped me understand the book a bit more because I think if I went in blind, I would be like, 
because what he says and what he does are two very different things. He's like very in denial with the things that he's doing. So it's similar to when we were orphans in this way, because when we were orphans also had an unreliable narrator. And this also has themes of like memory, because you remember things differently from other people. But I, I really enjoy this. This I think this is the best um, Ishiguro work I have read. I've read a few. This came out in 19... 89 it won the booker prize so i can see why people like it but i feel like the later books it seems to be like chasing the same feel because in this there's he reflects right he he just the, she goes like on a hill walks up a hill and then sits and thinks about what it flashbacks this kind of is it framing device i don't know what it's called but it's in never let me go as well it's also in clara and the sun actually it's in a lot of his books other than um the bird giant and it always feels a bit jarring it really it doesn't feel as smooth as it was in this one this one just feels like the transition just feels super smooth i don't know if it's i was in a good headspace or whatever but yeah i just felt like this it just, it's just a really good book. I gave... I didn't put a star rating for this. I think I give this a 4 stars. I think the other books I usually give like 3 or 3.5 3 is, is a 4 stars. And it's not very short, so... This is... Yeah, it's less than 250 pages. Moving on to the fantasy books I read. I just realised <laughs> most of it was on Libby. I only have like 2 books on hand here that I've read. <laughs> Ah, okay, so the first one was an audiobook. This is, it is The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. So um, the plot is just basically the retelling of Achilles stories from the Iliad, but in Patroclus' point of view. So I knew, I knew this was romance going in, but, but I did not expect how big the romance is to the plot. Because basically it's Achilles' story, right? So it's a lot of Patroclus behind him or like alongside him telling it. The thing is, it makes Patroclus seem very dependent on Achilles. So Patroclus doesn't have much of a personality, I think. Other than, you know, he got kicked out of his palace to, because he accidentally killed a boy. And then I guess that's his whole personality was just like he, he wants to be useful in a sense. But that's all he got. I, he, other than that, he's just like f constantly fawning over Achilles uh, and then constantly mentioning Achilles' feet. Which I understand, maybe it's just a throwback to Achilles' heel. But I, I did not like this. I did not like this. I loved Madeline Miller's Cersei. But I cannot with this because it's just so focused on the romance and the dependence. And then I, I like personally, I didn't get why Achilles would fall for Patroclus anyway. Man, I'm gonna get heat for this because this is so well loved. But I'm just what I wrote down is Patroclus is such a sim for Achilles, and I just like listening to Patroclus wax lyrical about Achilles' feet. Especially at that point, they were 11 years old, and I didn't even know they were 11 years old because he was writing it like he was like 18 or something. Like, who kind of. And then there was this. When they kissed, they, there was this descript description of like two bumblebees. And I'm like. What? <laughs> the lyrical writing is a point of Madeline Miller, right? But it just feels a bit forced. It's too much in this. And I think a lot of like metaphors and similes here didn't make sense. It's just too much romance. And I don't read romance usually. Like I, I don't like romance itself. I don't know how to say it. But like, like I can't even watch people kiss on TV. Okay, that's the, that's the kind of person I am. So I don't like... The, romance just makes me feel a bit... Eh, even though I'm married. But... <coughs> Yeah, but okay, I have to. The whole reason why I chose this and stuck with it is because the narration of the audiobook the, was very good. The voices were very good. I just. I really liked the voices. I also chose an audiobook format because I was crochet. Crocheting. Crochet. I still cannot pronounce it probably. Crocheting a uh, blanket. So it's easier to read. Listen than to read. Did I give a stars? I give this three stars. I'm very lenient. I don't give anything uh, two stars. 
unless I really really dislike it or one star one star is for Ariane <laughs> so the next one is a short novella it's a sci-fi it's called A Sound I think that's how I pronounce it I still don't know A Sound for the Wild Built by Becky Chambers the first in the monk and robots so apparently Becky Chambers is known for very feel-good comfy cozy stories so that's why I picked this up and also it was short it's less than 200 pages um, it also was um, nominated for the Hugo Award the story is the, that centuries ago the robots of Panga the world left civilization having gained self-awareness then they wandered into the wilderness so one day we follow this tea monk tea monk he is basically like a moving therapist that serves tea. They are unsatisfied with their life, decides to wander into the wilderness in search of some bug, I don't remember. The whole reason why they became a tea monk, they quit their previous vocation to, to become a tea monk because they heard some recordings of this bug and then they want to hear the bug in real life. But it turns out the bug is like virtually extinct in all the, the the human civilization places he, he wanders into a wilderness and then uh, when they step outside a robot approaches and asks them what do people need and they didn't know what to do they just want to do their own thing they want to do the search out some bugs right so they journey together overall it's a very cozy feel good read but don't expect the robot to actually read like a robot because it still does feel like a very naive human talking and there's like hints of philosophy through it but it's a, like like what is, what's this purpose of life what's the meaning of my life and all that and then the robot's like that you don't need this is, does anybody have a purpose and whatnot so it's just that kind of very reassuring read so it's an easy short read lovable relatable characters i mean you just have the monk and <laughs> and the robot and yeah 4.5 stars are really very high. It made me cry. I don't know. I just needed that. The next book is a fantasy horror. I think it's also YA. It's called House of Hollow by Crystal Sutherland. It's an Australian author. And this, something happened to Iris, the main character, and her two older sisters when they were children. But she doesn't remember. But there are like love news clippings about it. But she doesn't want to know, so she doesn't read the news clippings. It did leave an identical star on each of them. A half moon at the base of their throats. So I guess it's like... Yeah, because of that incident, the trio has been branded very weird by the rest of the community, by the schools. Vivian Gray, the second oldest and the oldest, left their hometown without finishing school. But Iris is determined to finish school and live a normal life. But everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. Everything changed when Grey went missing. And Iris and Vivian then try to figure out the whole mystery. If you're familiar with like mythical creatures, you'll probably know like where this is headed. But it hooked me. It hooked me. I still wanted to read about it. Uh, it has very good descriptive writing. And I finished it in one sitting. I just couldn't put it down even though it was like 1am. <laughs> and it reads like a dark fairy tale. It has very good vibes. Creepy vibes. There's body horror in it. Each character has a personality. Very distinct personality. And I really like Grey's boyfriend because he just read like a himbo. I can't remember his name but he was my favourite. <laughs> and I really enjoyed this book. I mean, yeah, the plot's pretty predictable, but it's well written, it's well paced. I think it's pretty well written, but some people might have some issues with the decisions they make. And I've, I've read that some people think like a certain plot is slow, but I know I read it, I read it in one go, I didn't feel anything off of it. So I really enjoyed it, and I gave it a 4 stars. The next book I listened to is an audiobook this time. It is called A Natural History of Dragons by Marie Brennan. It is a fantasy slash historical and it's the first in the memoirs of Lady Trance. This is set in the Victorian age but with dragons. So we follow Isabella as she tells us how she became a scholar and she's always been fascinated by dragons but as a woman, you know Victorian times, Victorian values. She can't re read this kind of, she can't pursue this kind of um, knowledge. So she marries a husband that appreciates her and her mind and will let her read <laughs> in his library and somehow manages to convince him to go on an expedition 
to Vistrana, which is basically like a Slavic mountainous country. That's the whole plot, this book. So it's written like a biography. Biography? Is that what they're called? So she's telling you how, how she became Lady Trent. Don't expect a lot of dragons, despite the name. Because I think it's a very bad thing. No, not a bad thing, but the marketing team kind of missed it, naming this a his natural history of dragons. And a lot of people were disappointed because the dragons actually take a back seat. Because the main story is about um, Isabella overcoming this difficulty and then going on this scientific journey. And when dragons are encountered, they are talked about in their like, habitats, their behavior. So it's like very sciencey. It really works as an audiobook. Like she's just talking to you and it's just so good. And the and all the voices, the narration, <laughs> very good for this. But it's, it does feel very slow. It does feel very, very slow because it only covers this one expedition. And Isabella herself, she has a very strong personality, but she has very big, not like the other girls vibes. Uh, but I personally didn't mind it that much. I don't know why. Yeah, I also read this one. I was crocheting. <laughs> and it is a very interesting book. So I gave this four stars. I also read the next book. I didn't read it right after the first book, I think. I think I read an Asian book in between. It's called The Tropic of Serpent. So it follows Isabella on her second expedition to Ariga, which is basically fantasy Africa. Uh, set three years after the book. So it's very similar to the first book. I just wanted to read it to make sure like I like the book because reading and, and listening to it are two very different experiences and I actually <laughs> like the first one more. This one felt way slower. I don't know if it's because I was reading it but it shouldn't be because like I read it so fast. Yeah, it was quite slow in the middle but the ending felt very rushed. So I think I'll continue this, this series, the Lady Trent series but in audiobook form so I can just like hook. Uh, I guess it is 3.5. So the last few books, and just talk about them together because they are the books 3 and 4 of uh, The Fate, Faithful and the Fallen, Ruin and Wrath. I, I, I won't hold them up, <laughs> it's very heavy. So they're both very thick books. I think I read Ruin way early on in the month and then read another book and then read Wrath. Ruin was basically more set up, more people dying. Finally, this one character realizes the truth. That's what I remember from Ruin. Wrath was just based on the Battle of Drasil. A lot of things happened that I didn't like. So, uh, yeah, I remember Wrath because it's just more frustrating. Like, the good guys are very unlucky and the bad guys are very lucky. So it's just very frustrating to read. And there are like chapters right after another where the good guy lives uh, during the battle or during a fight and then is immediately killed by the villain. Like the good guy lives while saving another person and then the bad guy just kills the guy. It happened like in two chapters like back to back or something. It just felt like, you know, too soon. And it just, I just didn't like it. And there was this one Kadoshim right? The, the beings from the other world. There's just one Kadoshim in Wrath. I don't remember seeing him in Ruin that much, but in Wrath, he, whenever he speaks, it's just like, I'll suck the brain from your eyes. I'll eat the marrow from your bones. That's the only thing he says. Like, he contributes nothing to the conversation other than, I will kill you and suck your flesh. And it's just like, bro, that's like peak edgy. I didn't like that at all because that was the only thing that he said. It's the similar to one of the other characters where when whenever he appeared, he was just like, my mom used to say that. My mom used to say that. It got a bit better in Ruin because he had some something else to say. But then eventually, he went back to, my mom used to say that. So my rating of the book series overall has dropped because of that. Because I just suddenly realized the shortcomings of this book and the characters. Like there are some characters that are developed very well. Like the Kerwin. Technically it's Cywin. But if it's read in Welsh, it's Kerwin. Kerwin had a very strong personality and I loved her. Brina had a strong personality and I loved her. They're all women. <laughs> Corbin, our main character, I felt I still felt like he's just like placeholder. At the start he was very skeptical of the prophecy. But like in general his personality is kinda bland. Other characters have better personality, like McQueen. McQueen's story. <laughs> I hate that how it ended. Cause you know, 
Fidel did the worst choice possible ever during a battle. Uh, Fidel goes to find Nasser and she's just like, oh, he's my son. He'll listen to me for sure, right? But then I, did she forget that under Nasser, there's this one guy that, that kidnapped her and like, and mind controlled her? Lycos? Lycos is another story. I hated him so much. But yes, <laughs> of course, Fidel gets caught by Lycos. Of course, Lycos gets away with so many things. He's such a snake. Like, he'll just run away. I guess villains just run away. That's why they survive. But they just do something stupid or do something that hurts the good guys and then they run away. Which I guess is the point of villains. But they, I just really, really hated them. Felt like, because constantly through this one book, so many things happened that felt like ass pulls. I just, I just rated the book down. Overall, the series, I'll just give it a 3.5. But like, I don't think I'll keep these books. I'll just donate them because I just didn't like how it ended. As also, it's kind of weird to say, but I'm so used to having like LGBT romance in my books that these, they're all straight in this. So I'm just like, can, but it just felt like in this epic fantasy, there's just like no gay people, but that's just me. Am I right? Yeah, so overall I will give The Faithful and the Fallen 3.5 stars. I won't read the next series. The next series is basically set 100 years in the future. No, I'll just read Shadow of the Gods soon. I keep saying I will read it next month, but I haven't. But soon I will read it. Yeah, so that is it for the month of May. Total of 12 books, including two audiobooks. I feel very weird because all the Asian readathon books, I just rated less than four. I never liked any that much. The thing is, I in general already read Asian books anyway. <laughs> but if it, the readathon gets people reading Asian books, it, it's pretty good. In June, I don't have any planned reading because whenever I say I want to read this, I never do. So I will not promise anything. It depends on my mood. And I, I'm not in a very big mood to read anything too heavy. But all I have are HDP books. Like, I have the Far Seer trilogy up here that I'll get to. I got um, Lies of Lamora that I'll get to. I got Watership Down that I will get to. And also, I, I bought a Kobo. It's not here yet, but then with a Kobo, I'll read more Libby books. So hopefully my reading will go up again. And that is it. I don't think there's anything more. So yes, like, subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter, even though I never tweet. <laughs> and yeah, comment. And I will see you in the next one, maybe? That is it from me. I will see you next time. Goodbye.